Number one, engage. You're listening to The Dune Steve, audio fiction magazine. And now here's your host, Rich Outfield and Big Anklevich. Hey everybody, this is Big Anklevich, and you are listening to another episode of The Dune Steve, audio fiction magazine. Here with me is... Rish Outfield. Oh boy. For Espanol, toca el asterisco. Oh, Rish sent his recording again. I guess that's uh, to be expected since it's my story that we're airing today. He's not interested. Wait, 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 wait. Stop. It is a story. (laughs) We are running a story this episode. Yeah, I said my story we're running. That's why you're not interested. (laughs) Oh, okay. Well... As are all the rest of the people. It's part of a story. It's some of a story. Yeah, that's true. It's only half. A bit of a story. But for once, you'll get the second half soon because it's a Christmas story, and so it's got to be out before Christmas. So there's that. Good luck. All right, everybody. Folks, if you want to hear the second half of the story this year, you need to donate to the show. Yeah, there we go. We need to bribe them. We need to uh, take them hostage. <laughs> All right. So, uh, yeah, today we have a story. This is part one of the story. Whoa, my voice just cracked out on me. That's all right. I'll introduce it. This is part one of a story That's... written by a certain B.D. Eyes Anklevich. That's right. And it is called, as far as I can remember... The Christmas Creature. (laughs) Yes. Sorry, something in my... You got something in your throat? Did you get it out? Yeah. Did you manage to cough up the fur ball? It was just phlegm, dang it. Oh, yeah. Nothing so pleasant as fur. I was going to say you ought to stop licking your arms so much. It doesn't really clean them off. It just kind of makes them smell funny. So, please... Anyway. Is there anything you want to tell people about this story before we run? A segment of it. <laughs> a sliver of it. Just a portion. Just a, a, a cutting of the story. Just a tiny little 40-minute section of this story. Super, super short. A fraction of the story. Yeah, this is part one of my story that I wrote last December called well i wrote most of it in april actually but i wrote a, a, i started it last december uh rish and i have started doing this thing recently where we write uh, a christmas related story during the month of december i guess it's kind of like the thing that we started all the way back when we first started the podcast where we had the october scary story event in which you had to write a scary story during the month of october And uh, now we have to write a Christmas story during the month of December. And we've done it a couple of years. This this time, we both did it. We meant to write them and try and get them out for our Christmas episode last year. Neither of us succeeded in getting it done in time. And so we just thought, well, at least we'll have episodes for December of next year ready to go. And so here they are. This story turned out to be longer than I expected it to be. So yeah, we get the first half of the story. It's just going to be the first part. And I'll leave you on a good cliffhanger. And then we'll be back again next week with part two of The Christmas Creature. Uh, Only if somebody donates. Oh yeah, if somebody donates. We'll be back again next week. (laughs) Otherwise, maybe February. What do you say? Yeah, okay. That'll that'll fit with the second half. It's really more Valentine's related anyways, when it comes down to it. (laughs) Uh, So yeah, we'll go ahead and jump into the story right now, and then we'll uh, talk about some other stuff when we get back, when when the part one of the story is over. (laughs) The Christmas Creature by B.D. Anklevich Brand walked in the door and dumped his bags on the kitchen counter. He couldn't help but beam at how well things had gone. This was going to be the best Christmas ever. 
the Christmas where he redeemed himself for all the failures of the past. Up until now, Macy hadn't ever had a reason to want to be at his home at all, much less for the holidays. But he was going to make this year so great that she would have no choice but to admit that it was better than Christmas with Mom or Grandma Liu or, hell, better than Christmas with Santa and all the elves and reindeer at the North Pole. His grocery sacks overflowed with decorations, trinkets, candy, food, and plain old holiday cheer. It was like Bing Crosby in a bag. He'd gotten a bunch of really great deals on everything he'd purchased, from the tinsel to the Twix bars, the fun-sized ones with green and red wrappers. It had all been on a last-minute sale, which was good because he didn't have much wiggle room in his budget, not since he'd started paying his child support again and the back payments that he owed as well. These decorations were his attempt to disguise the hovel that he lived in as a warm, inviting Christmas cottage. He had to get to work putting all this stuff up, too, because Macy would be here soon. He did the tree first. He considered an artificial one, but they were a little too expensive. The natural ones that were left were dried out, and needles fell from them any time you even breathed on them. But they were cheap as a song because of that. It should be fine, though. He only needed it for the weekend that Macy would be here. The decorations did their job better than Bran had hoped. It was really homey and inviting. Maybe he should just leave them up after Christmas had come and gone. Would they still make the place feel inviting in February, May, and August? Probably not. Bran guessed it would be more like seeing a stripper in the morning by daylight, the streaked makeup and tracks in her arms, eliciting hopelessness rather than arousal. For now, though, this overkill of merriment would do the trick. He loaded the eggnog in the fridge, along with the butter and eggs he'd bought to make gingerbread and sugar cookies with Macy, and put the molasses, flour, and nutmeg in the cupboard. There was only one bag left, the one from the thrift store. He'd been in the thrift store picking up some new pants for his job at the Jiffy Lube. He needed some more that weren't stained and threadbare. When Rose had called to see if he would pick up an elf on the shelf. They'd forgotten Macy's elf at home when they'd left Fort Worth. Macy had nearly been apoplectic when she realized she couldn't have Christmas without her little elf friend to watch and report on her to Santa. How would St. Nick know that she'd been good if Elfie, that was the highly creative name Macy had given it, wasn't telling him what was going on? And if Santa didn't know, he might not bring her nice presents. It was too late and too far for them to turn back and go get it. If he bought a new elf, Rose had said, Macy would never realize it wasn't the same one. Brand had winced at the request. He'd used up all the money he could spare on his decorations and other supplies. He'd have to keep wearing those old dirty pants for another few weeks at least if he bought an elf on the shelf. On top of that, he'd have to drive the 15 minutes back to Walmart to get it. That trip would have put him so far behind that he probably wouldn't have had time to get his place decorated. It would ruin everything. But then, a Christmas miracle happened. On a table of bedraggled Christmas baubles and tchotchkes, he found an elf on the shelf still in its shrink wrap and selling for pennies on the dollar to what he would pay anywhere else. It was almost as if the baby Jesus was looking down at him, seeing his sincere desire to change and delivering him a Christmas gift of good fortune. He'd bought it and brought it home with him, but now that he pulled it out of the plastic bag, he grimaced. It didn't look quite right. He peeled the cellophane off the package and opened it up. His eyes bulged when he got a look at the contents. Elf on the shelf didn't seem like the right way to describe the thing that was in there. Gnome in the home might be better, or even troll in the hole. The outfit matched the picture on the box, but the face was wrong. Very wrong. What was this thing? Some kind of Chinese knockoff? He closed the lid and looked closer at the book that came with it. His heart sank when he noticed that it said Elf on the Schleff on the cover instead of Elf on the Shelf. Crap. Would Macy notice? If she did, would his hopes to make this the best Christmas ever so that she wanted to come spend more time with him in the future be dashed? 
He had no idea that this would be the least of his worries. Hi, Brand, Macy said, voice devoid of warmth or excitement. She was expecting the worst Christmas ever from her erstwhile deadbeat dad. She was supposed to have spent Christmas at Grandma Liu's house, but the woman had fallen and injured her back. It took surgery to get her repaired, and now she was in no shape to watch Macy while Rose went on a cruise to the Bahamas with her new boyfriend, Ethan. Brand was the option of last resort. It was too late to get anyone else. He knew that they didn't really want to leave Macy with him for Christmas, but at least they trusted him enough to do it, even if it took an emergency to make it happen. Hey, Macy, how are you? Welcome to the North Pole! Brand smiled big and held his arms open for a hug. Macy looked up from staring at her shoes, but made no move to run to his arms. Brand should have known better than to open with that gaff. Handshake? He said, holding out his open palm. This went over a little better. Macy stepped up and took his hand. She shook it awkwardly, then looked back at her mother for reassurance. Rose smiled and held out the Spider Gwen backpack that was stuffed full of Macy's clothes for her to grab. After Macy took it from her hand, Rose bent and hoisted a second bag. This one, a big, black, hefty garbage sack. It was filled with Macy's Santa presents that he was supposed to put out for her on Christmas morning. They'd opened the rest of the presents before they'd set out for his place. Rose handed him the garbage bag and he took it and set it inside. Thanks, Brand, Rose said, though she didn't look him in the eye to do it. He couldn't blame her. They'd never had much of a connection beyond the one-night stand that had resulted in Macy's conception eight years ago, and even that had been accomplished with a healthy amount of alcohol shared between the two of them. No problem, Rose. Happy to do it. We're going to have a lot of fun, Brand said. Rose gave him a tiny, tight smile, then stooped and hugged Macy tightly. Okay, honey, Rose said to Macy. You can call my number if you need to. I don't know if it will work, but if it does... I'll take your call any time, okay? Okay, Mommy. Bye. Macy pouted out her response. Don't worry. It'll be okay. Love you, teddy bear. Rose kissed her on the forehead and then faded back to the waiting car, engine still on, where Ethan sat behind the wheel. They reversed out of the complex and were gone. Macy wistfully watched them go until not even their taillights could be seen, then resolutely turned to face her father. Hey, Macy. Bran said. I was wondering if you could help me out with this. An elf showed up at my house a few minutes ago. He says his name is Elfie and that he's here to make sure you get the best presents that you deserve. Her face brightened, then turned stern. Brand, Elfie is a girl. A she. Oh, (laughs) sorry. I couldn't tell because of that high-pitched elf voice. She talked to you? Macy asked. Yeah, elves talk to parents. Come here and see her. Brand led her into the apartment and pointed to where the elf on the schleff was sitting on the counter. He hoped this would work. He hoped that Macy wouldn't notice the difference, but as soon as she clapped eyes on it, he could see that it hadn't worked at all. She wasn't fooled. And not only that, she was revolted by the looks of the new elfie. Ew, that's not Elfie, she said. I don't, I mean, ew, that thing is yucky. Brand's spirits sank. Hopefully, this wasn't a harbinger of how the rest of the weekend would go. But he feared that it probably was. Creature is looking at us, Brand, Macy said. She had insisted that his replacement was definitely not Elfie and decided to name this new one uh, The Creature or something like that. She told him that it was the name of a character from Harry Potter, but he'd never seen the movies, so he didn't know who she was referring to. He went with it. The Creature was probably a fitting name anyway. She'd wanted nothing to do with it, so Brand left it on the counter and brought her into the kitchen to make sugar cookies. She couldn't let it go, however. She kept looking over her shoulder to make sure the creature wasn't creeping toward her with a knife in its teeth. He finally made a show of taking the elf, gnome, 
troll, and putting it face down in the corner. The creature is not looking at us. I put it down in the corner over there, see? Brand said, pointing at it. His voice petered out at the end, however, because he saw the elf was no longer face down, but sitting up and, indeed, looking at them. When did you do that? That's pretty funny. I didn't even notice you go over there and set it back up, Brand said. I didn't do that, Macy said. You're not allowed to touch the elf. Besides, I wouldn't want to touch that thing anyway. Okay, okay, Bran said, letting her have her fun. Well, I'm just going to ignore the creature and get these cookies off the pan so we can put some more on. He pushed the spatula under the six Christmas tree-shaped sugar cookies and put them on the paper that he'd laid out on the counter. He wasn't sure what you were supposed to do with cookies when you took them off the pan. The recipe online just said to let them cool. He guessed that paper towels were what he was supposed to use, but they were expensive, and he couldn't waste so many of them. Instead, he just grabbed some of the sheets of printer paper that he had in his closet. He'd had it for quite a while and almost never used it, so he figured it wouldn't be missed. What do you want to do next? Wreaths? Santa hats? he asked. Mmm, let's do snowmen, she replied. Snowman it is, he said, and grabbed the beer bottle that he was using as a rolling pin. He flattened the dough down and gave Macy permission to start pressing out the cookies. She managed to eke out four of them before there wasn't enough dough to make a complete cookie. She definitely could have gotten more, however, if she'd been a little more strategic with her stamping. He decided he'd roll the remainder of the dough back out again and show her how to do it. Teach her a little something. Wasn't that what dads were supposed to do? Okay, Macy he said, starting into his lesson. Let me put these in the oven, then I want to show you a little something. He felt like a total fraud trying to teach a kid how to make cookies. He had about as much experience making cookies as he did managing stock portfolios. His parents had never been the kind to make cookies with their kids. He turned and opened the oven. If you want to spend less time rolling dough and more... Macy screamed. Brand jumped and dropped the cookie sheet with the raw snowman cookies on the floor. It landed on its end and launched all four cookies behind the refrigerator. Brand spun around, expecting to find a homeless junkie menacing her with a knife. It wouldn't be all that unusual for this neighborhood. Instead, there was nothing. Nothing but a panicked eight-year-old girl with one hand to her mouth and the other one pointing across the room at... Nothing, really. At the kitchen counter? What is it, Macy? What happened? He asked. Creature moved. He jumped down onto the counter. See, he was up there in the corner, and now he's down there. The elf on the schleff was indeed down on the counter now. It had toppled off its perch up on the bar in the corner. God, what was the thing made of? Jello? Why did it keep moving like that? He thought he'd placed it securely in its spot, but it had both changed positions and then slumped its way off the edge of the bar. Super weird. It's okay, Macy, it's okay, it just fell down. That's what happens with things sometimes. Brand walked over and grabbed the stupid troll roughly. Here, I'll get it out of here so you don't have to feel anxious about it. He walked back to his bedroom and pulled open the drawer to his nightstand and chucked the damn doll in as roughly as he dared. Any worse, and he'd probably break the bottom out of the drawer. Then he slammed the drawer shut and went back to the kitchen. Okay, the creature is gone for good. You don't have to get freaked out by it anymore. He wished he'd done that in the first place. In fact, he wished he'd bought himself a new pair of pants for work and left the stupid creature in the thrift store. It hadn't fooled Macy at all, it had been a waste of good money that he could ill afford to spare, and now it was managing to ruin his perfect weekend with his daughter. Otherwise, it would be going so well. After this kind of crap, though, was she going to want to come back and see him again? I'm afraid to sleep out here, Brand. Creature will get me. As bedtime had grown closer and closer, Brand had noticed Macy get more and more tense. He'd tucked her into the blankets that he'd put out on the couch for her to sleep on, but she just wasn't having it. Of course, Brand had assumed it was because she was going to have to sleep in a strange house with a man that she really only barely knew, and her mother hundreds of miles away on a boat sailing out to sea. 
It was a lot for a kid to handle. Now she was saying that, in fact, she was worried about the creepy elf that he'd locked up in a drawer in his bedroom. Don't worry about Creature. He's locked in a drawer. Besides, Macy, he's just a toy. He's not alive. He can't move around on his own. He's not Buzz Lightyear or something. Brand still suspected that Creature was just an excuse and her real issues were the strange house and the absence of her mother. He wondered if he ought to bring it up and make her talk about it or not. Would that make it worse? Or was it what a good dad would do? He had absolutely no idea. I think it is like Buzz Lightyear, she said. I saw it jump down onto the counter. You saw him fall down onto the counter, Macy. It's just a toy doll. It's not alive. Can you try to go to sleep? Brand pleaded. Macy sighed deeply. She seemed so disappointed in him. <sighs> okay, she said, and rolled to face away from him, pulling the blankets up high. Brand sighed as well. Damn that stupid elf. It was ruining his weekend. He wanted it destroyed now. It wasn't enough to put it in the drawer to forget it. It needed to be in the garbage can at the very least. He walked into his room, threw the drawer open, and... It wasn't there. What the hell? He'd put it in the drawer himself. How could it be anywhere other than here? Could Macy have snuck in and pulled it out? Was she perpetrating some kind of a hoax on him? He had seen worse than this on people's YouTube channels, so it was possible, but Macy was only eight. The planning, dedication, and acting abilities needed to pull off an elaborate hoax like this one on him would probably be beyond the skills of an eight-year-old. So what was going on? Could there actually be something fishy about Creature, the troll in the hole? Good God, what was he thinking? Of course not. He didn't believe in crap like that. He wasn't a ghost hunter or a conspiracy theorist or a 9-11 truther or a spiritualist. Sure, Macy wasn't making an elaborate hoax video for her YouTube channel, but she probably was messing with him. An eight-year-old could pretend to think a toy was alive and move it around every time he turned his back on it. She probably snuck in here and pulled the thing out of the drawer, planning to set it up somewhere new to surprise him with it. It made the most sense. If only he knew his own daughter well enough to decide whether this behavior fit her personality or not. Was she a mischievous kid? He'd missed her whole life. He had no idea. That's what this weekend was all about. Fixing that. Atoning for that. This was going to be a great weekend. He could still make that happen. Maybe he needed to start playing along with her joke, pretending that he was scared whenever she next said something about Creature. Yeah, that seemed like a good plan. He could hear Macy tossing and turning out on the couch. He found himself doing the same in his own room. He just felt uneasy. He obsessed over his daughter and what she thought of him. He wasn't quite sure why it mattered so much to him. After all, he'd gone all this time without being a part of her life so far. She had a mother who loved her, and her mother had a nice boyfriend that could be her father figure for her as well. Brand had never spent a single night beneath the same roof as Macy. If she hated him, and didn't want to be around him at all, what would it really change? He guessed that it was because he just wanted to get his life back together, and forging a relationship with his daughter seemed like an integral part of that. He'd been a worthless slacker for years, and never provided any contribution to society at large whatsoever. But it didn't make him happy, as he'd expected such a life of hedonism to do. Instead, he felt empty. More and more empty each day. He needed to fill his life with meaning instead. And forming a positive relationship with Macy was the obvious next step in that journey. This game with Creature the Elf confused him. Was it important to her? Was he supposed to be her protector from the imaginary malevolent elf? Was it some kind of test to see whether he was worth investing the time to forge a relationship? Did kids actually go that deep? Maybe not consciously, but Brand guessed they definitely did unconsciously. He was... There was a noise out in the living room. It sounded like very light footsteps. 
Either Macy woke up and was wandering around the strange home in the dark, probably confused, or another motherfucker had broken in to see if he could help himself to some of Brand's stuff. He'd only lived here a year, but it wouldn't be the first time that happened. Brand wasn't allowed to own a gun for self-defense, but he did own a metal baseball bat. He grabbed it from its spot beside his bed, just in case, and made his way to the bedroom door to peek out and determine whether he was facing a physical battle or a parental one. Moonlight filtered in through the threadbare curtains, reflecting brightly off the vinyl floors. Over on the couch, Macy's head was visible in its own pool of moonlight, poking out from her nest of blankets. Unless she was very stealthy slipping back in bed, the noise hadn't been made by her. Brand raised the bat to the ready. He stepped out and slowly and quietly made his way into the room. It was a small apartment, and the whole place was visible from where he stood, aside from the bedroom that he'd just emerged from. If someone was here, he ought to be able to see them from where he stood. They might have tried to blend in with some of the shadows when they heard him coming, though. He walked toward the windows, where a prowler could have joined the darkness created by the curtains in the corner. But as he crept closer, he could see that there were only curtains and nothing more. He supposed they could have slipped into the coat closet near the front door, but wouldn't he have heard the door if they'd tried that? It creaked like a squealing pig whenever it moved even a centimeter. He walked toward the closet but it was closed tight. Opening and shutting it to turn it into a hiding place would have been so loud that the neighbors would have been calling to insist he turn it down. He glanced around again. There was just nothing here. Maybe he'd imagined the noise. As if on cue, he heard it again. Soft, stealthy footsteps. It was very quiet, though. Quiet enough that it could only be coming from a much smaller critter than a human being. Jeez, he thought. I'm not dealing with a burglar. It's just another rat. He'd trapped and disposed of several rats in the months after he first moved in, but it had been quite a while since he'd seen any. He'd thought he was through with that problem, but apparently not, and the varmint had picked the perfect time to attempt a home invasion. For a kid, coming face to face with a rat would probably rank nearly as high on the scale of negative experiences as dueling a robber would. He had to get the thing out of here before Macy woke up. It sounded like it was coming from just behind the couch, the only place he couldn't really see from where he was. He readied the bat, since it was his only weapon, in case he got the chance to whack the rodent with it. This was a pressing problem. He couldn't set out traps or poison and wait. To Macy, finding a dead rat could possibly be worse than encountering a live one. As he came around the corner of the couch, there was a soft thudding sound, as if a small rock had dropped onto carpet. Or something like that. He couldn't quite place it. The moonlight illuminated the floor behind the couch, and no rat, raccoon, or even cockroach ran scrambling for safety. There was nothing there. Except creature. What the fuck? He hissed out in a whisper. The bat slipped out of his fingers and clattered to the floor. There was a soft groan and a grunt from the couch, and Macy lifted her head off her pillow and wiped her eyes with a hand. Brand? What's going on? Sorry, Macy, he said, his mind scrambling for something to say that wouldn't alarm her in any way. I, uh, got up for a drink of water and I accidentally dropped my cup. Go back to sleep. See you in the morning. Her only reply was a sleepy moan as she settled back into her blankets again. Bran dropped to a knee, picked up his bat by the barrel, and snatched Creature with the other hand. He walked quickly back to his bedroom, shut the door, and snapped the light on. He dropped the bat into its usual place, then sat down on the bed with Creature gripped tightly in both hands. He stared at it silently for a long time. What's going on, Creature? he asked. The doll didn't respond. It stared back at him with its empty, unblinking, unmoving eyes. Brand watched it for a long time, his mind swirling with thoughts. What was going on? 
Was he crazy or could this inanimate object actually be moving around and trying to scare or possibly even hurt Macy? Was Macy the one responsible for all this? Or again, was he crazy and a split personality was doing this to try to mess with him? He'd seen movies like that. Inanimate objects didn't move. That was the definition of inanimate, wasn't it? Most likely, Macy was messing with him. She was grabbing Creature when he wasn't looking and then moving it to other places to fool him into believing it was doing it by itself. But he'd heard the noises. They'd come from behind the couch. How could Macy have made those sounds? Or maybe there really had been a rat, and it had just been underneath the couch out of sight, and the coincidence of Creature being there had led him down this pathway of thought. Well, no matter what, this damned elf had to go. Macy hated it. She didn't want it around to play spy for Santa. Brand was starting to hate it, too. It was an ugly abomination of a thing as well. It had no upside at all. He stood up, slid his bare feet into his tennis shoes, and went to the bedroom door. This mistake of an elf was going to the garbage. And just to make sure, he was taking it to the dumpster in the parking lot and depositing it there. The garbage man would come first thing in the morning as well, and Creature could jingle all the way to the dump. Brand hoped they had some kind of incinerator there that they used to dispose of the trash. The idea of Creature as nothing more than a pile of ashes made him smile. The sound of the garbage truck banging on the dumpster to empty out every last bit of its contents was what woke Brand in the morning. Usually, he cursed when that happened, but today it filled his heart with relief. He smiled. When was the last time he'd woke with a smile on his face? Probably never. Not even Christmas Day as a child had been good enough to cause him to rise and smile, and downright awful more often than not. He could hear the TV playing cartoons on low volume in the living room. Apparently, Macy had tossed and turned a lot less than he had after all. She was already up. He pulled on some pants and an old t-shirt and went out to tell her good morning. They were going to make some pancakes for breakfast today. That would be fun. And a good way to get back on the right foot. There's nothing better than cooking together to build a bond. And now it was Christmas Eve. Time to turn the fun up to an 11. Good morning, Macy, he said. How did you sleep? She looked away from the TV and gave Brand a sad grimace. Not very good. I had a lot of bad dreams. Oh yeah? Brand said. Was it because you were sleeping here on my couch instead of at home like you usually do? She grimaced again. I don't know. Creature was chasing me in my dreams all night long. It was scary. Brand chuckled a little. Well, you don't have to worry about Creature anymore. I took him out and threw him in the garbage, and I just heard the truck taking the garbage away. He won't be bothering us with his creepy, creepy face anymore. Now come on, let's go make some breakfast. I've got pancake mix we can make. You didn't throw Creature out, Macy said. He's sitting right up there on the shelf. He was up there when I woke up. I don't like to find him like I like to find Elfie. She wasn't creepy. What? Bran said as he froze in his tracks on the way to the kitchen. He spun around and saw that she was right. There sat that damned elf on the top of his TV cabinet. How? Holy shit! He stomped over to Creature, grabbed it roughly from the shelf, and stomped to the front door. He yanked it open, banging it on the wall, and threw the elf out the door as hard as he could. Just as he let go, he felt a sharp pain in the palm of his hand right on the meaty part of his thumb. Creature sailed through the air and landed softly in a bush that edged the sidewalk. Ow! What was that? Brand said, grabbing his throbbing hand in his other hand and looking down at it. There was a good-sized tear across his palm. Something on Creature had cut him as he threw it out the door. Or bit him. Jesus, was he going crazy? The cut was bleeding pretty heavily. He needed to get it cleaned up and bandaged before it started dripping all over the floor and his safety deposit went up in smoke. He slammed the door shut, though he wondered if that was the right move. Every time Creature was out of sight, something weird happened. 
Maybe what he ought to do was go outside, grab Creature out of the bush, bring it in, and stick it on the gas burner and fry it until it was nothing but ash. He was sick and tired of this thing. Sick and tired. Wow, Brand, Macy said. I didn't know you hated Creature so much. You might hate him more than me. Wow. Yes, Macy, I think I might, he said. Hey, I cut my hand somehow, so I'm going to go wash it off and get a Band-Aid. After that, though, it's pancake time. I'll meet you in the kitchen. Making pancakes was a lot of fun. They did several Mickey Mouse-shaped ones, because that was the easiest of all. Bran tried to make other shapes, like dogs and cats, but they wound up falling apart when he tried flipping them over. Macy didn't want to make any more pancakes, however, after Bran's hand dripped blood onto one of them. It had been difficult to staunch the blood when he was bandaging the hand up. And then, when he looked at what supplies he had, it was only a box of small bandages. What he really needed was one of those super oversized pads that comes in the big pack. But he didn't have money to waste on a big pack of assorted band-aids. He never needed a band-aid like that. Almost nobody ever did. Except, of course, when they did. They come in handy in times like today, but not when you don't own any. Oh, sorry, Brand said. Don't worry, I'll eat that one. He had an idea. He went to the bathroom and grabbed a wad of toilet paper and pressed it against his wound. He didn't own any tape or elastic bandages, so instead he found an old shirt that was fraying to pieces and ripped off a strip from it. He tied that around his hand to secure the toilet paper wad in place. Field medicine. It was like he was in a war movie. A war with a shelf elf? God, that was silly. You're not really going to eat that bloody pancake, are you? Macy asked when he finally joined her at the table. Why not? It's my blood, right? Yeah, she said. But it's gross. I guess, but don't you stick your finger in your mouth when you cut it? Then you're eating your own blood. Ew, gross. Macy smiled. Yeah, I guess. It's still kind of gross, though. All right, I'll throw it out then. Although, I bet it would have made it taste better. What? Macy shrieked. Ew. Brand laughed. Just kidding. Pass me the butter and the syrup. She slid them across the table, and he doused his food in both of them. So, he said... Santa is going to be at this strip mall over on Jefferson. You up for going to meet him and getting a picture of us with him? Sure, she said. Bran couldn't help thinking that she was a pretty good kid. Friendly, affable, flexible, and fun. Rose had done a pretty good job raising this girl. Or maybe she was genetically predisposed to that kind of personality. Bran didn't know how it worked. But if it was the second one, then at least he'd had some part in it. How come you don't have any presents under your tree, Brand? Macy asked, nodding her head at the scraggly-looking, dried-out conifer in the corner. In one day, it had deteriorated pretty significantly. There were a lot of needles on the ground now. It was like the tree had bad dandruff. Well, I don't need any under there. You already opened your presents with your mom before you came. Santa will bring you some more tonight after you go to sleep, though, Brand answered. But why aren't there any presents for you, she asked. Oh, I don't need presents, he scoffed. I'm an adult. Adults don't get presents. My mommy gets lots of presents. So did Ethan. They're adults, right, she asked. Yeah, I guess, but it's okay. I don't need any presents. I just like to give them instead, he answered. That's nice. You're like Santa, Macy said. Yeah, almost exactly, he said sarcastically. Macy wouldn't pick up on it, but that was fine. He couldn't think of anyone that he was less like than Santa Claus. Brand had spent his whole life up until recently thinking only of himself. He'd never considered how his actions might impact others. Santa, he definitely was not. Maybe someday he might be able to qualify as one of Santa's helpers. As an elf. Uh, That thought brought Creature to mind and soured his mood. Moving on. Okay, when you're done with your pancakes, take your stuff into the bathroom and have a shower. It starts at 10, and we don't want to be the last ones in line. Brand finished off all the pancakes, even the bloody one, 
after she went to take her shower. He didn't get big meals like this very often, so he didn't want anything to go to waste. When she emerged, he hopped in the shower as well. They were out the door by 9.35. They would definitely be there in time to get a good spot in line. They walked down the sidewalk heading toward the parking lot when Macy stopped. Hey, Brand, isn't this where you threw Creature this morning? She asked, pointing at the bush the elf had settled on when it came down. Brand's blood chilled. It sure was the spot. But the cursed thing was nowhere to be found. Brand got some great pictures with Macy and Santa, ones that he would treasure for all his life, he expected. He took a selfie, and the person behind him in line took some regular pictures as well. He was really glad that it wasn't like those mall Santas that won't take a picture without charging for it. And one single 5 by 7 costs at least $40. This Santa was meant to draw customers out to the strip mall, so his time was paid for by the stores. A godsend for a guy like Brand. He tried to keep it as fun as waiting in line for a picture could be. He was able to really get to know what was going on in Macy's life. She loved school and had so many friends that she couldn't pick just one as her best friend. When he pressed her, she allowed that it was either Sydney or Alejandra, or maybe Jimena. She loved to read and also loved it when her mom or Ethan read her a book when she went to bed. Ethan had been reading the Harry Potter books and they were now in book five. She liked the Harry Potter series a lot. She wanted to be Hermione. Brand had never read the books, so he couldn't make much conversation about them, but he made a mental note to find them at the library so that next time he'd have more to say. Through all of this conversation, the specter of Creature's disappearance kept haunting his thoughts. Just when he thought he'd chased it away, it would return again. How did it make it out of the dumpster and into the house? Macy could have possibly done it before he woke up in the morning, but how would she have even known where it was to retrieve it? Then, after he'd thrown it out the front door, she again could have fetched it while he was in the shower. That one was more believable because she'd witnessed his tantrum and seen exactly where he'd tossed it. Plus, she'd been the one to point out that Creature was gone when they were leaving. It didn't seem right, though. All the time that he'd spent with her since she'd arrived had given him the impression of a very well-behaved girl, not a nasty little prankster that couldn't tell when enough was enough. It really didn't seem like something she would do. Admittedly, he didn't actually know her that well. Maybe Rose would tell him that she was exactly like that, always playing pranks, improvising on the fly, flawless with her execution, and carrying them on for days but Bran guessed that Rose would say nothing of the sort. So, what the hell was going on? Macy told Bran that her favorite show was My Little Pony. Bran had never watched it before and didn't expect to enjoy it, but when they returned from their time with Santa, he found the series on Netflix and put it on to watch together. He told Macy that he was a complete pony novice and that he needed her help to know what was going on. So, as they watched, she adorably explained every plot point, character motivation, and joke to him like she was the narrator on the video description service or something. They watched the ponies take on various problems and foes and surprisingly, Bran didn't hate it. He actually found himself really appreciating the show and developing preferences for favorite characters. After a few regular shows, they watched the Christmas episode, and then Bran found several of the Christmas specials that he'd grown up on. He wanted to show Macy what he liked when he was her age. She didn't hate them, but they didn't hold up as well as Bran had hoped. He was specifically confused about why the Santa Claus on Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer was such an asshole. Disapproving and grumpy. He didn't remember that at all. He reminded him a lot of his father. At least what he could remember of him from before his mom sent the guy packing about the time Bran turned 10. They were still binge-watching away when Rose called to talk with Macy. They spoke for a long time. Bran eavesdropped for the first while, hoping to hear Macy tell her mom whether she was enjoying herself here or not. But it went on for so long he got bored and started browsing the internet on his own phone. His attention snapped back when he heard Macy talking about Creature. No, Mommy, it's not Elfie, it's some other elf. I named him Creature. 
She paused, listening, then said, Yeah, like Harry Potter. He's creepy, too. Not cute like Elfie at all. She paused and listened again. I think this one really moves for real, Mommy. Not like Elfie. I know that's you that moves her around. But this one moves around for real. She listened again, then laughed. Yes, I know it's you. After a second of listening, she said, No, I haven't seen it move, but every time it moves, Bran seems mad about it. He doesn't like that it moves. He wouldn't be doing it if it makes him mad, would he? Listening. And then, maybe he's tricking me, but I don't think so. He hates Creature. He even grabbed him off the shelf and threw him out the door today. And then, when he went out, Creature was gone. Brand couldn't believe what he was hearing. He'd spent so much time debating with himself as to whether Macy was playing with him, and the whole time she'd been wondering whether he was doing the same to her. What that meant was something that Brand couldn't quite bring himself to face, though. He stood up and left Macy on the phone with Rose. He went out the front door to where he had thrown Creature. He pushed his hands in and moved the branches of the bush around. Creature had to be here somewhere. He squatted down to get a better look. There should be some of that red outfit showing through somewhere, but he didn't see it. He dropped to his hands and knees to be able to look in the space under the leaves. That thing had to be there somewhere. He couldn't believe that it just got up and walked away on its own. It was a toy. A little kid's doll, not some kind of evil imp that was sent from hell to ruin Christmas. Try as he might, however, he could not find it under the bushes anywhere. What did it mean? Was Creature actually alive? Possessed by some demon and here to terrorize them? He was starting to believe that it, in fact, was exactly that. He gave up his search and went back inside to Macy. He walked in the door and screamed, Macy, look out! She was no longer on the phone with her mother. She had turned the TV back on and was watching Santa Claus is Coming to Town on Netflix. On the shelf right above her head, Creature was raising a kitchen knife and preparing to jump. All right, everybody, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed that portion of the story, that smidgen. Are you on the edge of your seat, or are you asleep? I hope you're not asleep. Darn it, you are asleep. Hey! What? what? I'm sorry, what? There we go. Oh my gosh, I've been drooling. <laughs> yeah. yeah, but you do that when you're awake as well, so... That's right. <laughs> Girls rule and boys, apparently, drool. That's right. Uh, so, you ended it right there. Uh, did you always plan on ending it right there? He asked, expecting the answer no. I didn't, no. I I kind of picked where Halfway was. And to tell you the truth, I thought Halfway had to have been a long time earlier than this. But uh, no, the story is longer than I thought. They always are. And I actually, you know, when I originally recorded it, I recorded and I just read the sections, the chapters of the story. They don't have chapter numbers or anything like that. They're just spaces in between, but... I read to where I was like, okay, that looks like about half. Then I stopped and then I realized, you know what? I actually took like the first paragraph of the next chapter and included it because that's where the cliffhanger part was. And I thought, yeah, that'll be stronger to end at that part. I agree. So I went with that. Before it was just like, he walked back to the apartment, the end. And I was just like, no, oh, that's... <laughs> That's kind of dull. Why don't I switch it up and have it be where the creature jumps off the shelf with the knife in its hand? That'll be more interesting, more of a good cliffhanger. So that's where we end, and we'll come back and pick up there next week. If you donate. Right. We're not really going to talk much too much else about the story, though, just because I, I figure we'll have much more time to do that in, in the next episode. When the whole thing is done, and, and I can talk about it without giving stuff away by accident. Huh. But uh, we can't end this, the episode already. I mean, it would not be a chore to edit if we did. <laughs> That's true. We, we can't do that. We've got to talk about something. But I have an idea. 
Okay. We could talk about the prompt for this year's Christmas story. Because we actually had a contest of sorts, anyways. We asked our listeners to give us a prompt. So we got a bunch of options and we need to pick which prompt we're going to do. Well, that works. So I th- That ought to kill a long time. Yeah, probably considering the way we just blabber and jabber on. Uh, so let's do that. Okay. So we've got here all, all the prompts that people uh, suggested to us when we gave them the opportunity to give us suggestions. Because, yeah, uh, I think a couple of years ago we had no Christmas episode and you and I both just kind of rushed out a Christmas story and we, we did that, and uh, this year I thought we'd make it an actual thing where we open it up for everybody to give us a suggestion so that it will be one that we write within the month of December. Uh, and yeah, we're going to make it kind of a thing based on uh, the suggestion that we have. And we're going to open it up further to the listeners. You can write a story. Uh, I guess we'll say within the month of January, you write a Christmas story. That goes along this li- these lines. And uh, over the next 11 months, we'll take the time to read all the stories and decide what ones would be worth putting into a, uh, a big Christmas extravaganza next December. So, our first suggestion. Daniel Hill suggests this. It's been a long time since Krampus won the yearly duel before Yule. So long he has become a faded memory. This year, with modern skepticism of children at an all-time high, it's going to be a true struggle for old St. Nick. Hmm. I mean, that's, that's a whole paragraph. Read it again. It, it is, yeah. It's, it's a little less open-ended than uh, I was necessarily looking for, but... Okay, so he says, It's been a long time since Krampus won the yearly duel before Yule. So I'm guessing that every year Krampus and St. Nick get together. They have a fight. Krampus won. Krampus man. So long he has become a faded memory. Now, I don't know why Krampus would become a faded memory if he won. You know, that seems weird. This year, with modern skepticism of children at an all-time high, it's going to be a true struggle for old St. Nick. Now, maybe we could shorten it and just be like, this year with modern skepticism at an all-time high, it's going to be a true struggle for old St. Nick, is our premise. Or maybe including Krampus in there somehow might be uh, worth including. I don't know. We'll, we'll, We'll leave that and let it percolate, and we'll move on to the next one, because there's a few. That one's really good, but I gotta wonder if... He's already got a story with that premise in mind, and he's just giving us that, which is which is fine. I don't think we said you <laughs> right. couldn't do that, but it's awfully specific. Yeah, he would have a leg up on all the other people that have to uh, <laughs> come up with something and write it in January. Okay, Monica Camarina. You know, I've seen her name a hundred times, but I don't. I'm not sure if that's how you would say it. Camarena. I don't know how you say her last name, but we're going to go with Camarina. Dystopian Santa. I mean, how do you deliver presents in a destroyed world? So I think this is, what is Santa's life like after the apocalypse? And you can pick, I guess, your own apocalypse, zombie apocalypse, uh, tribal apocalypse, nuclear apocalypse, whatever you want. Okay, Tom Meagill says drug cartel invades North Pole, makes Santa an offer he can't refuse to use his sleigh. So there's that one. Tom Tancredi says that his is a long one too. Oh, wow. His is even bigger than the the first paragraph. All the kids are too old to believe in St. Nick, but one. She slash he holds a deep, unwavering belief. Not for fun or sadness, but of deep certitude that St. Nick, the judger of all, 
will come and rain down his judgment. None will escape his eye. And when the sainted elf storms down with his chariot of fiery reindeer, woe, woe, woe to those who do not beg to be counted as nice. <coughs> for his deliverance is coal for the naughty. But that coal comes from the burnt offerings of failed spirits. And this night, none may escape his judgment. Are you done? That's the end. <laughs> Let me simply say, for that. Wow. Rectus Dominus. <laughs> Who was that? That's Tom Tancredi. So yeah. <laughs> oh wait, there's more. Hold on, hold on. There is more. He's got a reply to his own comment, so I didn't notice. Tom Tancredi, the twist. She knows she's naughty. So very naughty, but she won't be taken as coal. She has a plan to capture the sainted elf and his fiery reindeer, and she will rise above all when her plan unfurls. <laughs> and then he has another comment. Essentially, Tom wrote a short story and he says, here's your premise. <laughs> here's a short story that you have to write as well. <laughs> and then his... Uh, that felt like we walked into a video store and we read the back of the case. Yeah, seriously. He also says, I call it milk and cookies. <laughs> dot, dot, dot. So maybe we could shorten it just to the title has to be Milk and Cookies. <laughs> uh, yeah, that's quite a uh, quite a an idea, Tom. You're really going all out for this. Okay, the next one. Nathan Algram says you're invited to your girlfriend slash boyfriend's, or maybe we should let me say it again. You're invited to your girlfriend. Or, or, or boyfriends. Family Christmas dinner for the first time. But the meal isn't what you were expecting. That almost sounds familiar. What? You remember when in our first year I did your story Naughty or Nice? Although it wasn't called Naughty or Nice. It was an untitled Rish Outfit Yeah, it was joint. untitled Christmas Story 2004 or something like that. And I gave it a title. Wasn't it? I remember like the guy is on a date or something like that, or maybe he's just going out with some girl who is kind of hillbilly-esque. Uh -huh. And then she takes him back to the house, and isn't it like he's going to be the Christmas dinner or something like that? He uh, was dressed as Santa. I can't remember how it ended. I think he, he, was, he went to a bar or he was somewhere, and, and she... Picked him she up. picked him up, but t spoke to him as though he were really Santa. And he's just like, well, you know, whatever gets you there. But yeah, it became clear that she was mentally ill there at the end. And yeah, I don't remember how that story ended. I'm sure it didn't end well for the poor guy. Yeah, for some reason I was thinking that he became the holiday meal. I almost commented when I saw that with a link to your story, but I was like, I couldn't remember it well enough. So I thought, uh... Maybe I better listen to that story first, but of course I didn't, so. <laughs> Christmas dinner is not what you were expecting. Okay. I, hey, I like that one. I know I'm not supposed to say it, but. That's an early favorite? No, I just, I, it seems like that could go any number of ways. It didn't nail it down to a, something super specific. Uh-huh. Like, yeah, I want to see Tom's. I want to rent that video cassette that we just read the back of. <laughs> you want to at least read Tom's story that he wrote, Milk and Cookies? But you feel a little too penned in to have to write that yourself. Okay, Jonathan Gillespie says, A present is unwrapped, but inside is another layer. It says lawyer, but I'm going to go with layer of wrapping. <laughs> just as thick as the first. Folks are unable to unwrap the present despite competitions. The present is impervious 
to attempt to smash or detonate the box. It is Mjolnir of presents. <laughs> That's my own commentary there at the end. So yeah, a present that cannot be unwrapped. Each time you unwrap it, it's still wrapped. So there's that. Well, that just sounds like punishment, man. That sounds like the afterlife. <laughs> yeah, maybe that's where the the bad children that were on the naughty list in the uh, Dies Irae Christmas story that Tom came up with. Okay, Michael Gray says the FBI have been secretly using Santa's naughty list to launch preemptive secret renditions. I'm not sure what that word means. Isn't rendition just mean like a version of something? Yeah, but you, when you arrest somebody without trial and you take them to be tortured, that is renditioning. Really? Uh, the practice of sending a foreign criminal or terrorist suspect covertly to be interrogated in a country with less rigorous regulations for the humane treatment of prisoners. Huh. I had never heard that definition of the word. Interesting. Puppy monkey baby. What, wait, hey, wait, what? <laughs> what? What was that? What did you say? Puppy. Monkey. Baby. Now we have to put the friggin' parental warning on this episode again. Come on, man. <laughs> yeah, the warning. Warning! That's okay. We do that anyways. Okay, so back to that one. I didn't finish reading it. I got to renditions and was confused. Okay, start over. The FBI have been secretly using Santa's naughty list to launch preemptive secret renditions, but word is coming they may not have the right list. Mm hmm. So they may have been using the nice list. Void Munashi E. <laughs> says something's coming down the chimney but it's not santa wait sorry man how did they spell coming <laughs> with an o you're fine okay <laughs> it's long dong silver that one's not bad either that's got a good uh, good wide open vibe to it Okay, John Hyam says, Mountain cave opens up after an earthquake. What's inside brings change to humanity. Wait, well, can you All right. say that again, but in English? Like, don't say it in broken English. Say it in... Uh... Okay, a mountain cave opens up after an earthquake. What's inside said cave brings a change to humanity. Is that better? Yeah, now do it like caveman language. So even more broken English, like completely broken. Okay, a little more broken. Okay, mountain cave open up after quake. What inside bring change? I don't know if that was much better. I just dropped a few S's. <laughs> okay. That so, yeah. That one's not particularly Christmassy, though. That could be any kind of a story. Uh, making it a Christmas story might be more of a challenge. I guess the mountain cave opens up and Santa's workshop's underneath? I don't know. There's a whole bunch of elves, and the elves are like, Oh, shit. We've been discovered. And now they just live among us. Okay. Bob Metzger says this one. The aftermath of the 12 days of Christmas. So I guess once you've got all that shit that they give you on the 12 days of Christmas, what happens? But that's it. The, the aftermath of the 12 days of yep. Christmas. It, there's no that's, more. That's the whole idea. Just the aftermath of the 12 days of Christmas. So it could be post-apocalyptic. Or it could just be like, oh, how are we going to clean up all of these candy canes? What do I do with these 11 lords a-leaping? Oh, that's what you mean. Like the literal... Yeah. Oh, the seven swans a-swimming chat all over the front lawn. And the... How many maids a-milking? In the pool. Yeah, we've got so much milk. Who's going to drink all this? <laughs> okay. 
Tina Kolakowski says, The mystery gift is a haunted toy. Bum, bum, bum. What, the mystery gift? Yeah, I guess there's a mystery gift, and it turns out to be a haunted toy. Hey. I don't know where the mystery gift comes from, what its origin is. Didn't we do one with the premise, premise of no one knew where the present came from? There was no name on the box? Yes, we did. There was no name on the box. That's when you did the one where it was basically like you you and your father playing uh, Captain America. <laughs> right. And mine was that the kid had put a present on the girl that he liked doorstep and then it turned out to be like a yeti or something like that instead and he had to try and save the girl from the yeti also (laughs) my story that we're going to run this year is about a haunted toy as well so (laughs) this one may have to just be out i'm afraid it's too similar not oh no i was gonna say this one definitely is in because (laughs) oh because it's similar you're like tom Having already written that story. Right, but I wrote it last year, so I can't write it again. We're actually, most likely, this conversation we're having now will run on one of the episodes that includes this story. (laughs) Anyways, Dalton Huffine says, Someone spiked the eggnog. But with what? Bum, bum, bum. Wait, how did they spell coming? Uh, this one's with a U. Oh, no! And two M's. Like Alan? And you have to read it in an Arnold Schwarzenegger accent, too, interestingly. It has parentheses around it. It says Schwarzenegger, and then on the other side, slash, to show you that that's the out. The tag out. The, what do they call those things? In coding. I'm not smart with coding. I don't know what things are called. So yeah, spiking the eggnog. But what was it spiked with? Bum, bum, bum. Okay, Dave Wallace says, Werewolf trouble in the workshop. Wait, in Santa's workshop? I am assuming so, since these are Christmas story prompts. Yeah, I guess it's in the Chinese child labor workshop where they make tennis shoes. Right. It's in the sweatshop. <laughs> That they make all of Santa's uh, presents for him. Okay. Monica Camarina is back. Didn't we have her already? Yes, but she deserves more. All right. So she's given us a second idea. Santa Claus hunts down serial killers. (laughs) Which uh, Dave Wallace, who just gave us our last idea before, that says, not sure that's too far afield. For Josh Roseman's Secret Santa, so... That's right. Where is Josh Rose plus man? And yeah, so I gave her the links because Monica Camarino was unfamiliar with the Secret Santa stories. I gave her the links to our two episodes that we did on that, which sadly were done in many moons ago. Seven years ago, it says. Yeah, 2012 was first one and it looks like 2013 was the second one where's the date on these posts oh 2014 was the second one for krampusnacht sorry i'm getting distracted jonathan wilson says char (laughs) huh char char to you jonathan yes char you tree okay now there i did a second post saying last chance to give us a premise And we got a couple more with that. Oh, Dave Wallace is expanding on his original one, it sounds like. He says, A werewolf elf in the workshop could be a full-on furry terror piling up bodies or a just-wants-to-be-a-dentist type of misunderstanding. So I guess that's more werewolf trouble in the workshop explanation. You should try this one. Come on, you know you want to. (laughs) <laughs> Marshall Latham says how about a story titled The Last Santa that's probably broad enough for a broken mirror event I have some of my own ideas but I'd be interested to hear slash read yours and John Hyam gives us one more how'd we celebrate Christmas 
if we lost World War II. And Puppy Monkey Baby. No. Last but not least, Keith Teklitz says for his suggestion, the spirit of Christmas has arrived. All right. Now that we've gone through them all, Mr. Outfield, uh, what ones jump out at you in your mind? Which ones uh, really tickled your fancy? Other than the puppy monkey baby. Puppy. Monkey. Baby. Baby. So you said uh, mystery gift is a haunted toy is out? Well, it doesn't have to be if you think that we can come up with some other things. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the one I like is Nathan Algram's You're Invited to Your Girlfriends. Or Boyfriends. Uh, right, family Christmas dinner for the first time. But the meal isn't what you were expecting. Yeah, that one is in my top five, I would say. I like that one because it could be a funny one. It could be a comedy. It could be poignant, uh, you know, something sad. I was like, oh, Christmas in my family is a tragic observance. Or, or of course, you know, in my mind, immediately it becomes, it's something scary. Uh, it could be a um, most dangerous game kind of thing where <laughs> everybody brings a significant other to be hunted for Christmas. Right. Although, boy, that, that's a pretty good idea. I shouldn't have let that slip. What Anyway, I just I like the possibilities on that. But uh, let me know what ones grab your mystery gift. Uh, I like the dystopian Santa, which is pretty simple. Just, you know, there is a destroyed world. And how does Santa exist in that? I like the something's coming down the chimney, but it's not Santa. That's a pretty good kind of open-ended thing. Probably a little less versatile than the first one. It's not likely to be a happy unicorn. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I guess you could have that be a funny story, but it seems more likely it's a scary story or an action, you know, thriller kind of thing. I I guess it could be an erotic Christmas story. Ooh. Mystery Gift as a Haunted Toy isn't bad, but... Yeah, I just feel that it's too similar to the story that I wrote this year. Plus, you already compared it to the other one where it's like, no one knew who the present came from. It was a mystery <laughs> gift. Yeah, I, I guess I did. But I just, I when she said mystery gift, and again, it's a uh, tweet speak, I guess. You know, it's, it's uh, just, you have to conserve letters because, uh-huh. you know, a telegram costs a certain amount. That's right, per word. word. So when it said mystery gift is a haunted toy, I just thought, okay, well, what does mystery gift mean? Right. No one knew who the present came from. Someone spiked the eggnog, but with what is kind of fun, too. It's just, you know, everybody at the party is drinking the eggnog, and then they, what happens? You know, you have a lot of different possibilities of where it can go. Okay, I guess I can see that. I Immediately, I just thought... Well, you know what I thought. Coming. But uh, after that, <laughs> I thought murder kind of thing. I thought it had to be a horror story, uh-huh. but but it doesn't. It could be a horror story in many ways. Could be murder. Could be werewolf juice. Everybody's turning into werewolves, or now they have werewolf trouble in the workshop. You could combine the two. And I also actually really like the spirit of Christmas has arrived since spirit of Christmas has, you know, you can come up with a few different meanings for that. It could just be a plate. (laughs) I'm going to have to veto that one just because you mentioned the plate. That's right. I was going to accuse you of having written a story called the spirit of Christmas, but that was us. Yeah, it was. So are you still mostly leaning towards that first one that you mentioned? Yeah, I thought we were just supposed to pick our favorite. I like that you went down the, you know, mentioned the ones that you dug. That's cool. I should. But you're still, I haven't swayed you. The, the, you know, the post-apocalyptic one sounds interesting, but I just feel like that's rather limiting. 
I guess you could have a heartwarming post-apocalyptic Christmas story. Oh, and it's dystopian Santa. I almost feel like that's more of a novel prompt than a, a short story. Yeah, prompt. it does feel like that. Because A, you have to come up with what your dystopia is. And that could be any number of things. As long as it's high school, then, <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's a dystopian Christmas story with Santa in it, which narrows it way, way down. If somebody said, if, if Monica said that she had written a book about that, I would want to read it. Right. Did we have any limits on word count or anything like that? Have we announced exactly how this is going to work? No, we have not. You and I, I don't think we'll have a limit on word count for, for you and I, but we probably will put a word count on listeners' stories because we only have a year to get them all read. <laughs> And it's just you and I again. We don't have any Oompa Loompas anymore. That, those days are long gone. I'm sure somebody would volunteer to help us out with this. Although, I mean, it would just end up being a third vote, right? Because I, I, I imagine we would end up having to read all of them. Because the, I don't think we have the listenership that we did where we'd get 50 submissions or 30 submissions or two. Yeah, that's probably true. Unless the only people who stuck around are the people that like to write, then we'll be in trouble. I, oh, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> we talk about writing so much. Why would somebody that's not a writer enjoy listening? Yeah. But yeah, I would say 7,500 words is our word count limit for, uh, for listeners that want to join in. But for you and I, we're, we're going to leave it open-ended. Just tell the story that you want to tell. 7,500 words is a lot. Sure. I mean, that's over an hour for a story read aloud, but still, but you're saying that that is the ceiling. Right. We hope that people don't write massive stories, but if they want to write a long one, 75 is... is, is yeah, is. I mean, I don't expect people to write that much, but that is the outer limit. Do not go beyond that, or we will not read it. Okay, well, uh, tell me again what the other rules are. For you and I, the rule is write a story based on the premise that we decide on within the month of December. For listeners, we they will find out what the premise is as December is coming to an end, and therefore they should write a story based on the premise that we have given in the month of January. So on February 1st, we better have your story or it won't be considered. And then your story and my story will air next December, plus a smattering of the best stories from any listeners that get submitted. And I'm not going to say a number. Maybe it will be one, maybe it will be two, possibly even three, but I wouldn't guess more than that. Probably three is our top amount. Okay. Because they're, they're going to have to all air within December, so... I think we'd probably start... On Thanksgiving week, the goddamn radio started with the friggin' Christmas music the day after Halloween. Uh, yep, that's what they do. If I could work my will, every idiot that goes about with Merry Christmas upon their lips <laughs> should be boiled in his own pudding and buried with a stake of holly. Uh, yeah, through his heart. Okay. Well, that, that sounds very Grinchy. I don't know if there's any other character out there that might say such a thing. Probably not. So I'm going to compare you to the Grinch. Okay. <laughs> Anyways. Uh, yeah, so those are the rules. And uh, have we decided? Are we, are we going with the, uh, the meal? Well, I don't want to override you. If there is one that you prefer to the, you go to your girlfriend's or boyfriend's house and, you know, the Christmas dinner is not what you expected. I just, I like how open that is. Okay. And I, I am curious what people's interpretations will be. Okay. Because, you know, maybe they're nudists. Yeah. Anyhow. Yeah. I mean, if, it, if, if that's the one that, that just straight, I mean, I like that one as well. Uh, and if none of the other ones are really grabbing you, then uh, I say we go for it. And that will be our 
actual prompt. Okay, so we have decided. It has been spoken. The prompt is you're invited to your girlfriend's... Or, or boyfriend's. Family Christmas dinner for the first time, but the meal isn't what you were expecting. So thank you to Nathan Algram for that suggestion. That's what we're going to write our stories on this uh, this December. So thanks for listening to part one of The Christmas Creature. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you're jonesing for part two. And you folks know what to do if you're jonesing for part two. If you're uh, smithing, then yeah, just lay there. You don't have to do anything. But if you're jonesing, donate button right there. It's available on the doonsteve.com. Yeah. You can throw a little something in the tip jar for the folks that put on this fabulous show that you're enjoying today. All right, I oversold that. I'm sorry. Anyways, thanks for listening. Uh, we'll see you again next week. And I've been Big Anklevich. And I've been, I've been the rich outfield creature. How's that? All right, that works. Uh, yeah, we'll see you next time. Take care. Bye-bye. Thanks for listening to The Dune Steve. The Dune Steve audio fiction magazine is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Rectus Dominus. Take two. Hi, Brand, Macy said, voice devoid of warmth or excitement. <laughs> that doesn't sound like a voice devoid of warmth or excitement. God, what was the thing made of? Jelly? Oh, that should be jello. But something spell checked it for me. Uh. Just to let you know, my story, my Christmas story, is like 15,000 words which is about the same length as Fireflies was, which means it's going to be almost two hours long. Holy crap, dude. So we could easily just put this on as the post-story chatter for my story, part one, for example, and then the second part, we talk about the story itself, and then we can do your story, or you can do your story first, whatever you want, but... It's going to be uh, a bigger episode. And now a word from our sponsor. Puppy monkey baby. So I, I made the mistake of going down and looking at some of these YouTube comments. Okay. The first one says, you fools, he's leading you to the gates of hell. Which I thought was pretty good. But then it <laughs> says, uh, Julian Robinson wrote, don't get high and watch this. I started crying and my homies had to hold me down. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Joseph Reniger said, even the music has a creepy vibe to it. That music sounds like ritual sacrifice music. This thing lures people with Mountain Dew, a well-liked soda, and then murders them with his other mutant unexplainable creatures. Yeah, <laughs> it was the creepiest thing. I, I'm surprised you didn't know about it. No, no, I did. Because I, I know you watch the Super Bowl uh, raptly every year. But no, I didn't know he said puppy monkey baby. Puppy monkey baby. I didn't know that it spoke. Puppy. Monkey. Ew. Baby. <laughs> okay. Yeah, worst thing ever. That's scary. Why you say it's scary? Just a, a lot of work. Well, I'll do my story completely myself. I'm going to present Anklevich's gift for my Christmas story this year. Is that okay? That was my Christmas story uh, to 2015. Can I read it to you? <laughs> okay. Anklevich had died right in front of me, most of his lower half crushed or missing. His last words were, as much as I could understand, my something passes to you. Maybe it was get... Maybe it was gift. The funeral was strange. I must have looked miserable, 
because women I didn't even know kept approaching, trying to comfort me. <laughs> Anklevich's goth cousin tried to get me to go to the funeral home restroom with her. Maybe I should have gone, but my friend was dead and, well, I was a little afraid. No one had ever propositioned me like that. Grief does funny things. But now, it's two days later. I'm at Del Taco. The girl behind the counter is being awfully flirty, reminding me of what it was like to go places with Anklevich. She handed me the receipt, and her hand lingered on mine. As I walked away, I looked at the receipt. I was customer 69. The cashier winked when I turned back. <laughs> How many times have you used that uh, customer number 69 in... Uh... I know there was another thing where you did that, where it's like, must be my lucky number, <laughs> or something like that. That's a fun I, one. You know, that, That's going to be your Christmas story this year? That wasn't a Christmas story after all. With the title, Anklevich's Gift, I thought. <laughs> oh, that sounds like a Christmas story. But it was more of a perennial, any holiday, any day of the year story. And heartwarming. Yes, it was. It was really heartwarming. Okay, so my story is only 14,011 words long, but yeah. Oh, okay. Well, then, yeah. I didn't realize it was that long, to tell you the truth, when I wrote it. When I looked back on it, I didn't think it was that big. But it is, uh, it is big. So we can, you know, I mean, it won't be that, it won't be any harder for you, I don't think, because I'll read it and edit it myself. There's a couple of characters that you might be able to do a voice for, although I don't, I think they're all girls. Like. Do a search on Amazon. I thought it was called what? You thought it was called Puppy Monkey Baby? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I thought it was called What You Deserve. It's called What a Girl Wants, What a Girl Needs, Whatever Keeps You Happy and Sets You Free. Oh, wow. I didn't think you could go on. I'm that. thanking you for giving it to me. Whoa, whoa, really? Is that how it goes? <laughs> Was that Christina Aguilera? It, oh, you know damn well it was Christina Aguilera, sir. I I wasn't sure. Because there was a bunch of different girls that came out at the same time that were young singers. I know that Christina Aguilera also did Genie in a Bottle. Yeah, you have to rub her the right way. That's right. If you know what I mean, that's coming yeah, that, with a U. That's, I wanted to say that song was... Uh, a single entendre, but it, it actually was a double entendre. I, I guess there could have been people naive enough to say, oh, this is about a genie, a literal genie. Okay. I guess that's it for this. That gets my goat. If it, act, if it actually does become that gets my goat. So I'm going to say goodbye to the folks at home. Thanks for listening. I've been Big Anklevich. Or Boyfriend. Uh, oh, and I've been Rich Outfield. All right. See you uh, next time, folks. Good night. Okay, I'm going to hit stop on the recorder. I pressed the button. You're listening to the Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine.